So far, we've always looked at representing a signal graphically as a function of time. So we always plotted the time on the x-axis and then the equivalent signal, the signal we are looking at, at the y-axis, the amplitude of it on the y-axis, which then actually gave us a graphical representation of the signal. We can do that in a different way. But that one is only defined for sinusoidal and repetitive signals. So where the mean value, average value, the one with the many different names, and the RMS value was defined for repetitive signals only, we are now adding another constraint, and that is now it has to be a sinusoidal. So that one is no longer valid for a square wave or for a triangle wave, for a sawtooth, and so on. We're still starting out with the time representation, the mathematical representation uh, of an AC signal as a function of time. And in this case here, I'm using an example, which is a cosine of omega t plus a phase phi. So the omega is the angular frequency, 2 times pi times f, where f is 1 divided by the uppercase letter t, which is the period, the repetition rate that we've got up here of the signal here. Here I'm using another variable for indicating the amplitude. I'm using a v underscore p, where the, the underscore p stands for peak. Previously we used v hat. There are different ways of writing that. No, I'm using a, an underscore p for peak. Now, if we look up in a textbook how we actually can describe a, a cosine and a sine wave, or the other way around, how we can actually describe an E function, we can find the Euler equation here, which says E powered by J alpha is the same as the cosinus of that alpha plus J times the sine alpha. Now I'm using j as the square root of minus 1, where some people tend to use an i for that, but as we electrical engineers use i already for the electrical current, I'm using j as the square root of minus 1 here. It's a matter of taste. If you like to use uh, I instead, don't confuse it with the current, but you will see many electrical engineering textbooks using J for the imaginary number, which is the square root of minus 1. Now, if we apply that Euler equation here to, or compare that Euler equation to our original signal, we can see that the cosine of alpha here would compare to the cosine of omega t plus phi, which is the real part of the right-hand side of the Euler equation. So we could rewrite the whole thing as using e powered by j alpha and replace the alpha with omega t plus phi and then only take the real part of that. So now I'm replacing alpha with omega t plus phi here. So that equation down here would be cosinus omega t plus phi, and I don't care about the rest here, the imaginary part down here, as I'm anyways applying the real part, that's the funny looking R here, the real part of cosine alpha plus j sine alpha would only be cosine alpha, which then replacing omega t plus phi would be the same as the real part of the Euler equation of the Euler way of connecting cosine and sine to the E function. That means I can directly rewrite V as a function of T into this whole equation down here. Now using the rules that apply to the exponential functions, if the exponent is a, a summation or a difference of two arguments, we could actually multiply or divide the two exponential function. In this case, I have an omega t plus phi, and I have a j outside the brackets here. So I can actually split it up into an e j 
j omega t times e j times phi. Um, still keeping the real part as it's been up here. So we, have, we leave the real part and the v peak has always been in front of the bracket. So we take that one out of the bracket. Now, as we are engineers are often dealing with a lot of information, we actually try to eliminate the unnecessary part of the information. If you're, for example, working with the grid, with the AC mains distribution network, you wouldn't know that the frequency is 50 hertz, and it would always be like that, or 60 hertz if you're in America, but it would always be like that. If you wanna focus on your job, on the very specific voltage or current that you're currently looking at, the 50 hertz is extra information that your brain doesn't really need to process. So if we rewrite the whole equation in the way that we take the VP inside the brackets, then we know that we can actually throw this equation out as long as we are dealing with one frequency only, as long as we know that all the signals we are currently looking at are at the same frequency, and the remaining part, which is defining the whole signal that we are interested in, is actually the amplitude and the phase only. So from our original equation, we eliminated that part because we assume that it's always the same. So this is for sinusoidal signals, for repetitive signals. And once we're going to use it from here on further in other applications, we now also fix the frequency. And we know that this the phaser is only valid at one specific frequency. Note also that down here at the definition of the phaser V, I'm using an underscore, and V underscore is actually a complex number again, and it can be expressed by the same Euler function as we used above. Here is the VP without the underscore, so that's a real number only, that's the amplitude. It could, for example, be 300 volts or 150 volts or whatever. And then it has a specific uh, angle, a specific phase compared to our originally defined zero in time. So all the information we need to know, as long as we know that we are working at a specific frequency, is coded inside those two parameters, the amplitude and the phase. And as this is the Euler equation we can use we can apply the Euler equation that we've looked up in a math textbook up here and rewrite the whole phaser as we have here as the summation of a cosine, which is here, plus j times a sine wave. And the arguments of those are the phi. And also here, the argument is the phi, where the amplitude of both of them is vp and VP here. So the real part of the phaser is that one here, and the imaginary part of the phaser is what's left behind our J. Now I've promised you that we're gonna represent the, the sine wave in a different way graphically. So we no longer have the, the time on the x-axis and the amplitude on the y-axis, where we could see the frequency, we could see the phase, and we could see the amplitude. Now we've thrown the, the frequency out, and we are left with the phase and the amplitude only to represent our signal, and then we can relate other signals later, irrespective to our first defined signal. Wherever zero was in, in terms of time, is going to be our real axis down here and has the phase zero. And as we are dealing with an arbitrary phase here, an arbitrary signal, as we find on the previous side, a slide here, we can plot the phase phi in the phaser diagram as this angle here. And then the phaser also has a lens as we are representing any imaginary number in an, in an imaginary diagram the amplitude, the length of this vector here is actually the, the amplitude of the original signal, Vp, and down here we have the real part of our phaser, 
all of that is the real part of the phaser and all of that is the imaginary part of the phaser and J is up here as a part of the axis label. Remember again, phaser is only valid for one frequency because that's the information that we fixed and left out by going on to this simplified representation of our sine wave. It might occur different to you, it might occur even more difficult to you. It's a simplified in that sense that we are actually throwing out some part of the information that is defining our original signal to make it easier to handle more signals and to have less balls up in the air when we are trying to actually put things together. That could be a voltage, a current, and an impedance. Impedance like a resistor, we'll look at that later. Could be an inductor or a capacitor, we're going to look at that later. But as soon as we got more balls up in the air, it's hard to actually keep them up in the air if we also need to carry the unnecessary information of frequency along the way. Let's look actually what's happening if we have more than one phaser. Say we have two signals, two voltages that we're adding, that we're stacking on top of each other. So we have a voltage one as a, as a function of T and we have a voltage two, which is a function of time as well. Then we can represent both of them as a phaser V1 and a phaser V2 and the unnecessary information of the frequency is actually out in the exponential function, which is e powered by j omega t. We only take the real part of that, as we've seen on the previous slide here. Then kicking out all the unnecessary information, so knowing that both signals are actually at the same frequency, we, we leave that one out, we don't carry that one along, and we only have the real part left. Then we only have left what's inside those brackets here, which is the summation version of our original signal here, which is the overlay, the superposition of V1 and V2. So now let's work on with that, the summation of V1 and V2, where V1 and V2 are each their own, phaser representation, this one being V1, this one being V2 here, we can destruct those in the same way as we applied the Euler equation to our single one phaser as we had on the previous slides, but now we have a V1 phaser here represented by the real part and the V2 represented by the real part as well as both of the imaginary parts that we actually can sum up together here. So we have the resulting phaser at the end here, which is the summation of our two original phasers. Now applying all the, the math of the imaginary numbers to this upper equation here, we can derive the equations which are the amplitude of the resulting phaser is the absolute value of the phaser, is the square root of the real part squared plus the imaginary part squared. The angle, the face of the re resulting phaser is the arcus tangens of the imaginary part up here, divided by the real part down there. And the overall resulting phaser, the V sum, is the combination of the amplitude that we've just defined here times E powered by J and its argument, its angle of the phaser V sum. Now let's have a look at the graphical representation of summing those two phasers together. V1 and V2 were our original phasers and you can actually exchange it the way you want to do it. You can either say V1 plus V2 or you can say V2 plus V1. If we start at the origin, we go out this way and plot first our vector, our phaser V1 in the complex area. Again, on the, on the real axis, on the x-axis, we got the real part and on the y-axis, we got J times the imaginary part of all the phasers that we're working with. 
And then at the end, at the tip of V1, we actually add V2 and we end up with the summation phaser as the result of it. We can project each of the phasers down here. So that would be V1 here and that would be the resulting phaser of the summary of both of them. We could certainly also have gone the other way, first plotting V2 and uh, starting with that one, so adding V2 plus V1. So we would have gone up to that point on the imaginary side up to this level and on the real part down to that one here and then add the phaser V1 on the top of that and we would end up at the same exact point in the phaser diagram that we are looking at. Remember, all of that only works if both signals have the same frequency. But you can go further on and add more and more phasers to that, add more voltages together, and the same applies for currents. Now that we have looked into phasers and the different representation of sinusoidal repetitive signals here, it's your time to actually try out your new skills and calculate these exercises here.